Pyre is gorgeous, and I don't know why. It's taken me so damn long to sit down and finish it. I started playing it in July 2017, back when it was released, 11 months ago now, and I only finished it a week, or maybe two, depending on when this video comes out, ago, at the end of May 2018. The first thing that comes to mind when I think of Pyre is... God damn it, this game has the most beautiful, vibrant, living colours I have ever seen. Every single scene in this game could be a wallpaper. Every single scene in this game is something I would much prefer to have surround me instead of the white walls of my apartment. There's something to be said about a game developer who can put out such a remarkable amount of stunning video games, just on a purely graphical standpoint. But there is so much more going in Pyre than just the beautiful outer layer, than the graphical presentation. I'm talking about deep characters, the mixing of possibly three video game genres and somehow making this product work. A deep world, I don't know how to count in my fingers, a very deep world, fantastic characters again, and a very fun to listen to blabbery language that the characters speak in whenever you read their messages, uh, pardon, whenever you read the text, their dialogue, it's, it's something very strange, and unlike anything I have ever played before, there's a lot to say about Pyre. So I'm just going to put a few things out here. I'm going to run through my favourite features of the game. And it's going to be fun, hopefully. The graphics are well and fine, but we all know it takes a lot more to make a game worthwhile. Or at least we all should know. Maybe the boys at DICE don't. I'm looking at you, but from two, I'm looking at you. What does this game have going for it? Detail by detail. First of all, Darren Corb once again returns in the world of gaming with a fantastic acoustic and vocal presentation that simply makes this world much more believable, much more exotic, and nothing short of sublime to listen to. I have spent hours since I finished the game just listening again and again to my favourite tracks, and even those that I don't like as much as my favourite ones, they are worth listening to many times over. Take a listen to this, for example. The home is known as the Commonwealth, and it is not a nice place, not at all. For one, reading is outlawed. So if you've got books, and if you can read, you will be sent into exile into this horrible wasteland where the game takes place. With the player say the role of the reader, who obviously reads and takes control, guides his fellow exiles into tree on tree matches of very strange sports. Yes. It's it's like basketball. If you consider individuals throwing themselves into the enemy's pyre in order to diminish it. A regular thing that happens in basketball. And yes, they are holding a ball. And yes, they can throw the ball in the pyre if if they want. A lot of the time you spend while playing the visual novel, you will be making choices. And these choices have a lot of outcomes. Outcomes upon outcomes upon outcomes, which depend both on the choices you make inside the visual novel and on the ones you make while you are, you guessed it, 
playing insane fire basketball. It's a lot of fun, first of all. Second of all, there's no lose state, no defeat state. What I mean to say is that no matter how many times you lose at dangerous, fiery basketball, you will keep moving forward. Sure, you can go back and restart while you're still in the match. You can restart the match and try your hand at winning. But if you lose, and you shouldn't be afraid to lose, if and when you lose, more like, losing is a part of the story. When you lose, things happen. Things that wouldn't happen otherwise, and things which are quite interesting. If I had anything to say about it, I would say, try not to lose, but when you do, don't restart the match you're playing. It might seem like it's worth it if you're going after some lofty goal to win, but I think it takes away from the experience of the game. This game has been crafted with the idea that you cannot lose, not in the game over end state. No, your losses just add to your own continued story. And I think that's very unique, that's very interesting. It's not the first game to have done it, certainly, but I think it adds something unique to the story. Something that I personally really enjoyed. And something that took me in a direction I did not expect. How about the characters themselves? In a game which is three-fifths text-based, the writing of characters can make or break the game. In here, as before, Supergiant games do not disappoint. I have enormous respect and admiration for the guys who are writing these games. None of the adventures we've seen so far, neither Bastion, nor Transistor, nor Pioneer, have anything resembling weak writing. Even though some people I seem to recall did not like Transistor as much as they liked Bastion, I still thought it was a very powerful game with a very, very interesting story and my favourite game of 2014, probably. Probably. The thing is, Pyre's characters are all memorable, they're all interesting. The way you play the game and communicate with your fellow exiles will very much add to their personalities. You can change them, you can learn lessons from them and teach them lessons of your own and those will often stick. So the thing is, what you're trying to do is you try to liberate your fellow Nightwings through a liberation rite, which is just one more of those basketball games, fire basketball games, but with a lot more stakes on the side. If your team wins, one of your exiles will go on to be liberated. If your team loses, the leader of the enemy team will then, of course, go on to be, you know, liberated on his or her own. And sometimes that can have some pretty horrifying effects. I think. I think. The thing is, who do you decide to liberate first? Because if it's your favourite character, or your most useful character, or your most powerful character, you go on for the rest of the game without ever playing with that character. So it was that I... the first liberation right? I chose Hedwin who was my primary player, and I really loved interacting with him. I absolutely enjoyed spending time conversing with Hedwin in between matches and while traveling inside this uh, wasteland, whose name I completely forgot. It just absolutely slipped away. The thing is, once I sent him to be liber liberated, he was gone, and this relationship was gone. And so it was very bittersweet, and every liberation right I won was very bittersweet, because I saw friends, or rather the reader saw friends he loved, friends he, he cared about. Those friends, they were no longer there. And that, that is a very interesting thing they did at Super Giant Games. They managed to make you care about people, so you want them to get out of their exile, to go back home, to help uh, build up on this plan 
that's spoilers, all about taking the Commonwealth down and changing things around through peaceful means, not through uh, weapons of war. So it is that you lose people, you lose your best players, because also you can't, you can't send whoever, you can't send your weakest characters, your characters, they have ranks from 1 to 5, and you need to be at, at least rank 3, I think, in order to have your characters sent on their way. Now, that makes for a moral choice of sorts. Do you send the ones you least liked? Because, well, you know, once they are outside, you can s keep spending time with your favourites. But then, how is that fair to your favourites? Right? Because they deserve, maybe they deserve freedom more than those guys you just send because you don't like them, because they're pricks. Although I have to say, no one in the team is actually a prick, I don't think. There's some, of course, some are more likeable than others. That's, I think, completely normal. But none of them are pricks. None of them are unlikable. All of them have a story to tell. They have their personal stories. They have their personal lives. They are living, breathing characters, all of whom, I think, were written really, really, really well, and all of whom you want to see freed. And when you mess up and you don't win a liberation right, you feel bad, because at some point you realize the liberation rights are finite. So no matter what you do, you will never release everyone. So that just adds yet another yet another issue to what you have to consider as you pick your choice in the next one and the one after that. <sighs> it's a really good game, <laughs> obviously you can tell. My favorite character? I, I'm wondering between Faye, the crazy girl who hears the voices of the prophets, no, not the prophets, the scribes. You see, the scribes are the ones who came up with the liberation rights. You learn this very early on. Faye is a crazed, I think, 16-year-old with grey hair. She looks amazing. She's got these uh, red eyes. And she is probably kind of uh, possibly schizophrenic, but 100% awesome and very friendly and outgoing. And other than hearing the voices of the scribes, which she might be, she is fantastic. The second character I completely adored was Captain Judariel, who is this powerful demonic woman with big horns and an imposing figure presence which just completely blows you away. Even through the text and through her, or, uh, through her voice work, she sounds absolutely badass and she is the most physically powerful character in the group, without a doubt. Other characters were fantastic. Hedwin I already mentioned. There was this sea knight who was all about glory and honor, and he was adorable. I enjoyed Tizo the Wise, an imp, a demonic little imp, who is nothing short of the most adorable thing you've ever seen. He's fluff with tails with a tail and two horns, one of which is, I think, kind of broken and um, put back together with something that looks a lot like uh, tape, which is weird, but he is completely adorable. We've got um, the bog dweller Bertrude, who is intimidating and scary, but also interesting. We've got uh, Mr. Sandalwood, whose name, whose first name eludes me right now. I don't have it in my notes. I have, I actually have just a tiny bit of notes, which I prepared whenever I lost my train of thought, which happens a lot, but not too much. Never too much. What else? Uh, who else, rather? We've got, um, we've got this puppy, this adorable puppy who is a uh, rogue, he's a fun rogue, he is in love with the Lady Pops, and he is nothing short of... Uh, well, he is the sexual revolution in puppies. 
There are more characters, I think. Yeah, definitely. A few more. There's the Harpy, there's the Harpy. The Harpy is really interesting and her art is kind of sinister in purely in its aura. It's very, very interesting. Her personal story is about two sisters, two Harpy sisters. She's on our team and her sister is on the other team. And her sister actually won one of the two liberation rights I lost and she went free. And part of that was because the sister, she asked me to let her go. And you know, I couldn't, I couldn't deny her in a way. But also I, I had just returned from playing the game, from not playing the game for six, seven months. And I had totally forgotten how to play the game, how to do the actual uh, basketball part of the game. So I sucked completely at that and I lost. No excuses. Absolutely no excuses on that front. That's, that's about all I have to say right now. Amazing characters, a world which is both deep and very, very interesting. And oh, of course, we've got Logan Cunningham returning to his role of narrator, and this time I literally thought he was another guy when I first listened to his performance here, because he sounds a lot more like me, and a lot less like that gruff, really low, really, really epic voice which narrated both Bastion and Transistor. He sounds completely different, he sounds more like, Greetings, reader! What have we here today? Reader. What brings you to the spring of Jomia? Why, it must have been the stars. Although it seems that your triumvirate now numbers four exiles, not the expected three. The rules of the rites were not created for you to besmatch. Prepare now to confront the fate. They still honor the traditions of the scribes, and surely have been longing for this chance. But first, you have a choice to make. And here's this deeply sardonic, sarcastic, caustic uh, announcer who basically um, narrates what happens during, during combat, during the basketball matches, during the pyre matches, let's call them that. That's much better, I think. And what else am I to say about this? This game was truly, truly a celebration of everything that made the previous games great in terms of art direction and writing, just general quality of writing, as well as a fantastic new venture into genres you would not have expected Supergiant games to touch upon. I, when I was thinking of, hmm, what will be the third game that comes out of Supergiant? I never thought it's gonna be a sports simulator with, you guessed it, visual novel with a bunch of characters. What? Thank you for watching this. It was an extremely amusing video to make and I can't wait to do a lot more of its like. I've decided to break away from the format I've been using for the last few year, for the last few months to try and do something different, something with camera, something with my face on it for at least a portion of the time. And I think it's it works. I hope it works. You're gonna tell me. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, share it, subscribe and leave a comment. Let me know what you enjoyed. Let me know what I could do better. Let me know if you enjoy that handsome mug of mine. And I cannot wait to see you next time. Bye!